Hi, so I'm Tanya Simon, and I'm where Vicky were we? Vaughan. I'm Vicki Vaughn. And we wrote Zora and Me. We're incredibly pleased and honored to be here with you. And we were hoping to just have a really open dialogue. So we love to share what we know and our thoughts about the process and about Zora, but we also really welcome your questions and comments and thoughts about the book, your criticisms, any, anything and everything. Okay, well, it all began, I was pregnant with my daughter. It was my first child, and they told me it was gonna be a girl. And I became very excited, and the first thing that I thought about was all the books that she would read that I read as a child. And I particularly loved as a child a book called Caddy Woodlawn, about a little white girl on the Wisconsin frontier who got into all sorts of trouble but who also had a real humanist heart and who goes on to save the Native American population that's endangered by the racism of her town. And this book had a profound effect on me as a child and I thought I wanted to give my daughter a protagonist who was connected to the natural world, who was deeply rooted in her community and who was also fearless. But I wanted, it, I wanted her to look like me. And when I was done having that thought, Zora Neale Hurston jumped into my head and I thought, that's the childhood she had. You know, I don't even have to make it up. She had it. She grew up in the first all-black incorporated town in America. And she was a nature lover and an adventurer. And then right after I had that thought, I picked up the phone and called the greatest person I know <laughs> over there. Tanya's the greatest person I know. So I called Brilliance and Beauty and I said, come over to my house and eat some lasagna and I have an idea that I'd love to work on with you because we'd always be kicking around the idea of doing work together. And yeah, and oh, yeah. how do I know? Okay. Okay. So as soon as Tanya pitched her idea to me, it was almost instantaneous. You know, we started going back and forth about the things that we knew about Zora's childhood. Tanya had already had her imagination kind of hinged on certain details. And for me, it just seemed like a, just a kind of, just a wonderful journey. You know, we were at a school earlier and I was telling the students that making art and writing that some Times you have to build the Legos, so to speak. You know, you have to make the bricks, you have to make the mortar. But working with a figure like Zora Neale Hurston, who already had such a rich history and so much wonderful literature for us to survey and be inspired by, it's like we had we already had our Lego set. It was just a matter of what kind of house, you know, if you will, we were going to build with it. And I think for both of us, that just seemed like such an inspiring journey. I think one of the things that was so important to us, once we talked the idea through and we knew that it was something we really wanted to, to do, is that we were both precocious readers as, a, as children. And I was always somewhere in the corner with glasses on, reading something, who knows what. And I think you were too, Vic, right? Yeah, so much. we didn't we didn't meet Zora Neale Hurston as readers until we were in college. And one of the things that we wanted to give to young people, young African American children, but any child who's interested, is we wanted to give them Zora before that. We wanted them to meet Zora and know Zora and have a hook in their head for Zora because She's one of the most important American writers that we have. And we thought maybe if they could meet her, you know, if we had met her, we would have been devouring their eyes for one. We would have devoured everything before we even got to college. By 16, we would have made our way through the Zora canon, you know? And that was one of the things that saddened us, because we'd heard about the boys, right? Langston, Rich, you know, the boys you can get in high school a little bit. You more than me, Vic. I went to. Um, schools where they just didn't have as much African-American material. And 
But I knew who Langston Hughes was before I went to college, and I didn't know. And of course, you know, they were best friends, and I didn't know who Zora was. And we thought that that was a tragedy. Yes. No, we have not met A.G. Ford. And I think the book now has almost been out for a year. So at this point, I think we are just accustomed to looking at it. <laughs> but I think when we first saw it, we you know, had a mixed bag of feelings. But what I think I will say, and I think both of us feel this way, is that one, one thing that I think we now both appreciate about the cover is the fact that a black child is looking back at the potential reader, back at the audience, that the, the protagonist, Zora, as she is depicted, has an active gaze. You know, she's not, she's not being objectified. In fact, she's looking right back out at the reader. So that's something I think we both now can appreciate. Though I think when we first saw it, we were a little cold to it. Yeah. Well, we first, we, we lock ourselves in a room and we talk. <laughs> and we, we talk sort of through who we think the characters are and what we think motivates them. and. Of course, what was so happy making in this book is that we both had an intimacy with Zora. So we both had a pretty clear idea of who we wanted Zora, the girl, to be. And we've been friends a long time, so our, our sort of worldviews are very meshed. So we actually never had conflict in the entire process because we generally think the same things in different ways, would you say? Yeah, and so we talked it through, and then Vicky did a lot of voice exercises in the beginning, and she would say, we both knew one thing when we started, and that was that we didn't want to write in Zora Neale Hurston's voice. That felt wrong, it felt like presumptuous, you know, it felt like too much. And so Vicky started writing from different perspectives. How do we approach Zora? so that we have the intimacy we need with Zora, but you know we can still move the story forward without being Zora, and then we hit on Carrie the best friend, right? And Carrie pretty much embodies our love of Zora, because you know, Zora didn't have a really close woman friend in her life to turn to, and we wanted to give her one. spread for a few months. I think we talked about starting this in October. And I think after that, I went home, ordered some books, started thinking about it, looking at my bookshelf. And then I think January felt like we could write, you know, start writing. But the thing that was fun, besides reading Zora Neale Hurston's materials, of course, it was also a lot of fun to read her contemporaries. You know, so since we have a passing narrative in our book, I read Wallace Boy Thurman's, Miller. yeah, sorry. <laughs> you know, I read Wallace Thurman's The Black or the Berry, and also Jesse Redmond Fawcett's Plum Bum, because I thought it would be, it would be good for us to have an idea of the, the spectrum, as Tanya said, the snow to crow of, you know, black literature at the time. So we could come to our story with as much knowledge about Zora as well as about her contemporaries and just the ideas that were at play while she was working. Yeah, I also think one of the things that was really enriching for us about the process of working on the book was that there were so many themes that were personally important to us that were echoed in Zora's life. And one of them is home. And we both felt like whatever happened, we're neither capable nor interested in writing a book about black urban degradation. And we both have a connection to the South. And we wanted to really showcase black children in an enriched, loving black community, which Eatonville was. And so Zora and Carrie and Teddy, the three main characters, they are not impoverished in any way. They possess kingdoms. 
and they're able to approach life's difficulties. There's a murder in the novel, a gruesome murder that we actually took from Zora's autobiography. There had been a headless body found in her town. And that had always sparked in my head, like what would Zora do with a mystery like that? And so we took that seed and we, you know, we kept wrapping a pearl around it that became the novel. And I think we use the theme of passing really to show Zora's profound commitment to Eatonville, so that one of the things that Carrie and Teddy and Zora learn is how indelible the imprint of that early life has been on them. And when Zora goes out to the Harlem Renaissance and she travels and she writes, folklorist, novelist, journalist, playwright, right, anthropologist, ethnographer, there's no end to the number of things that she goes on to do. But Eatonville is at the core of every single thing she ever does. And so we wanted to show that beloved community that could produce that wellspring, that could nourish her talent for literally, you know, 60 years of her life. We thought so much about Teddy and we really wanted Teddy to have, he's a boy's boy, but at the same time, he's a profound nature lover. Teddy is like a guardian of the earth. He, in a way, he could grow up to be a veterinarian, right? He's somebody who's extremely connected to the rhythms of, of nature. He is connected to the farm life that his parents have. His parents are landowners. And so clearly they have that sort of very strong southern middle class farming ethic. Does that make sense? And Teddy is secure enough in his masculinity that he can be friends with two very outspoken and intelligent girls and hold his own. And at the same time, have them, you know, creep through the forest and show them a razorback pig that he has no fear of. So that's who Teddy is to us. Yes, last spring we went to, actually before we went to Eatonville, we went to Fort Pierce where Zora died and was buried. And that was just really a marvelous experience for us because I'm sure many of you have heard this very heart-wrenching tale of how, you know, penniless, down and out, and forgotten, Zora left this world. And going to Fort Pierce, meeting people, yeah, Alice Walker's, you know, her narrative of going to the graveyard, and which at that point was very overgrown, and yelling out, Zora, Zora, and all this. I'd like to yell out, I don't know, money, money, who has to call my head? <laughs> so she yells out, Zora, and is able to identify, and all that kind of business. So when we actually went to Fort Pierce, and we met people who knew Zora, who were actually students of hers, they gave us a very different take on the end of her life. And a hundred people <coughs> attended her funeral. There was a, a choir there. You know, she uh, by no means was wealthy, but we went to her last home, which was just a perfect little writing nook. You know, just a bedroom, a little kitchen, a living room. But it was a really, I think for both of us, it was a, a really powerful commentary on what people think is important. So if you do great work and you fall out of favor and you live in this place that's rural and people like you there, but these are not big city people, these are not money people, then you have died in the gutter. Irrespective of leaving this earth with integrity, doing what you want in a community where people love and respect you. And it was clear to us after visiting Fort Pierce that that was the case with Zora at the end of her life. She may have been sick, she may not have had any money, but she was not poor in spirit. <laughs>